Hello, I'm Dickie Arbiter in London. And I'm Victoria Arbiter in New York, and you're watching Royal Report. Throughout his adult life, Prince Andrew has made a litany of poor choices, particularly in terms of who he's chosen to socialise with. But in terms of his public standing, there has perhaps been none more catastrophic than his interview for BBC Newsnight. Despite believing it had gone well, his life has since completely unravelled. Now, with two series based on the interview set for release, the coming months promise to be further trying for the beleaguered royal. Before we get into all of that, Dad, I am going to lean into your experience on what it's like working behind palace walls. Uh, historically, we know that personal long form interviews for members of the royal family do not go well. This is the beacon if we're going to look for one of interviews that did not go well. How was it ever allowed to proceed? It's interesting you say, how was the interview allowed to proceed? I really don't know. What is quite interesting, I'm actually meeting Sam McAllister in a few days' time to have tea with her. But in the meantime, I've read her book, and she endorsed in her book what I've been saying all along from the moment that he opened his mouth on that interview in November 2019, uh, being interviewed for BBC Newsnight by Emily Maitlis. Where is the press officer? Where is the press secretary? Where is the communication secretary? Because why are they allowing this to go ahead? Sam McAllister made very clear in her book that the initial approach came from Buckingham Palace, not from the communications office, but from his office. And they wanted an interview done with the Duke about his charity called Pitch at Palace, very good charity, very worthwhile, an organisation that helped young entrepreneurs get off the ground and start up a business. It was very successful. Its sponsorship was big. It had a lot of big hitters involved with it. But BBC said, no, we're not interested. I mean, why would you be interested? A hard-hitting news programme, why would you be interested in a, in a charitable organisation? So it laid to rest and nobody bothered recontacting each other. Then a few months later, they were contacted again uh, about an interview. Uh, and it's when the whole business of Jeffrey Epstein came back with, within the interview, a reference to his charitable organisation. So the lead interview was the Jeffrey Epstein affair and the side issue was his picture at Palace. And they hummed and hard and they went round the houses and they had meeting after meeting after meeting. The last meeting before the thumbs up were given for the interview was between with Sam McAllister, the editor of the programme, the, uh, another producer of the programme, with the Duke and with Beatrice, which they were surprised she was there. Uh, and they threw all sorts of questions. They went round the houses about how the thing would take. And then a few days later, they got the thumbs up for the interview to go ahead. So you had this preamble of meeting after meeting, putting the thing together. Still nobody any the wiser within Buckingham Palace, within the communications office, because anybody, anybody in communications worth their sort would have said, no, it doesn't happen. In fact, when I spoke to Sam a few days ago, she said to me, if you were there, what would have happened? I said, it wouldn't have happened. End of. Um, and if I hadn't known what was going on and I'd gone up there uh, during the course of the setup, I would have asked. Uh, and I would have said, no, there and then. It's not going to happen. Dad, so before you continue, I have so many questions on what you've just said. So first of all, let's be clear that Sam McAllister is one of the producers that helped secure this interview. Her book, Scoops, is what Netflix has based Scoop on, and, and that's being released soon. Amazon, we're going to talk about the Amazon one in just a moment. Um, so yes, you say no, this interview wouldn't have gone ahead. But what happens when the principal is adamant that they're going to do something? So that's the first part of my question, because this also relates to Diana in 1995. She knew that everybody would say no, which is why she proceeded with her interview for Panorama and didn't tell anybody. And of course, then there was the big fallout. So 
when your job, the, the key purpose of your job is to protect the principles, how are you able to protect them from themselves? Well, the key job is to protect the monarchy. The monarchy is an institution and by default, the monarch and every attachment to the monarch, meaning the children. Um, I would have, if I'd been there, I would have been in at the interview. And as soon as it started, the subject matter would have sent red lights, warning, flashing lights, flashing blue lights, you name it. And I would have stopped it there and then. Would have created a story, um, but it's a better story to create than uh, one that came out of it that is still rumbling around, that actually saw the demise of his contribution to the institution, his demise of his contribution to charities, and his demise of his contribution to the military. So he would have probably still carried on if somebody had been there and stopped it, or even found out what it was all about and stopped it going ahead right at the very beginning, right at its genesis, rather than allowing it to go ahead and Andrew out in the cold. So I think really what we have to address in terms of what happened here, and it is clear, it is really important to point out that to date, Andrew has not been investigated, charged or convicted of a crime. The case that he settled with Virginia Jeffrey was a civil case, not a criminal case. Um, and it's important that I, that is noted. Uh, personally, I'm, I don't think I'd risk, I don't want to speak for you. We're not huge fans of him. He's known to be quite arrogant. We'll get to that in just a moment. But I think the fallout really, part of the reason it was so catastrophic was at the time it was conducted, Jeffrey Epstein had died in prison. Um, but Andrew talked about being too honourable to have ended his friendship, even though he spent time with Epstein after he'd been convicted of, of procuring a minor. He, there was that horrible stuff about not being able to sweat, uh, the Pizza Express story. But more than anything, for me, the worst part was his apparent total lack of remorse. He showed no empathy for the victims. He showed no sense of contrition. It was all about, well, I, I was too honorable to end a friendship over the phone. I had to go in person. I mean, like, like head blown kind of thing. And, and then to be so arrogant, to think, oh, well, that went very well. I'm all in the clear now. And of course, his life came completely undone. And I think the punishment fit the crime in terms of how he conducted himself, because as you rightly point out, he was stripped of pretty much every royal privilege short of breathing. Um, and now he, it was his birthday on February 19th, he turned 64, which is relatively young in royal years, given that gene pool, what does he do for the rest of his life? And even though he has kept out of the public eye, for the most part, he's attended a couple of family occasions, he has kept out of the public eye, but in the court of public opinion, he has been deemed guilty. And none of us are judge and jury. None of us get to sit and make that kind of verdict against someone. But he hasn't helped himself, has he, in terms of how he conducted himself? He hasn't helped himself. I mean, conducting himself by doing that interview and saying in that interview, as you said a few moments ago, actually, uh, he is honourable. He couldn't end the relationship over the telephone or email or texting. He had to go there, not only go there and be seen and photographed in Central Park, but go there and stay with Jeffrey Epstein in, in his house. I mean, it makes you wonder about the intelligence of the person. Uh, why would you do that sort of thing? Um, he doesn't talk to anybody. He doesn't bounce ideas off anybody. It's interesting that at the time of the planning for the interview, he had his daughter in at the meeting, who is not what you would call a communications expert. I mean, anybody could see the optics and where it was going. And anybody with any sense of nous would say, this is just not on. It should not happen. As you rightly say, he's been tried and convicted by the court of public opinion. He hasn't faced a criminal trial. He hasn't been prosecuted. Um, uh, but unfortunately, through his own arrogance, and that's the only way to describe, and he is arrogant. Uh, I'm not sure he's too arrogant at the moment. But he certainly was arrogant in my day. And there was an element of arrogance that came across in that interview to actually think it went well. Then he's a victim of his own self-importance. This is Dickie Arbiter in London. And I'm Victoria Arbiter in New York. 
Dad and I are thrilled to be back on YouTube and we are so excited to see that we have just soared past 6,000 subscribers. So thank you all so very much to all of you who have subscribed. We really do appreciate your continued support. If this is your first time here or you haven't done so already, please do subscribe now. By doing so, you'll help the channel continue to grow significantly, which will allow us to bring you even more fact-filled content on Royal Report. Without your support, we just can't do it. So we've set ourselves a target of 10,000 subscribers. Look down at the bottom of the screen. How do you think we're doing? Please click on the subscribe button now. There's no cost to you because subscribing is absolutely free. And don't forget, you can also click on the little bell, which means that new episodes will be sent direct to your homepage. Thank you so much. We are thrilled and grateful to welcome each and every one of you to our Royal Report Club. We'll see you next time on Royal Report. Do you think if he hadn't done the interview, he would still be a senior working royal? He could probably be a working royal um, if he hadn't done the interview, but all the accusations were swirling around uh, and he would have had to live with those. And the legal team might have found another way around of trying to put all those accusations to bed. Um, I don't know. I'm not a legal eagle, but there would have could possibly be a way of doing that rather than putting yourself up in front of a camera for the world. And we're talking about it was a global a phenomenon, that interview. Uh, everybody commented on from, from Australia all the way to Alaska. Um, so if he hadn't done that, he could probably still be a working royal. But that is looking through a crystal ball, trying to wind the clock. Back, and there's no point doing that. Well, uh, it was inevitable that it was going to get global attention because he's a member of the royal family and the British royal family garners headlines the world over. It's why these long form personal interviews don't go well. Um, whenever anyone talks about Prince Andrew, there's kind of this staple party line that he was the Queen's favourite son. Um, on any given story, it's then Peter Phillips is the Queen's favourite grandson. Oh no, just kidding. That's Harry. No, that's William. So I don't put a lot of stock in Andrew being the Queen's favourite. Um, I think there's love to go around, as any parent will say, for all your children. They did share a close bond. He did live in Windsor, where particularly during the pandemic, she spent pretty much all of her time. Um, do you put any weight behind him being her favourite? I don't put any weight about him being the favourite. He's probably slightly more um, than, 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 say, Edward. You've got to remember, when Andrew came along, he was the second family. Charles was born in 48, and born in 1950. Ten years later, there's another sibling. So there's this great separation. By the time Andrew came along, the Queen had a lot more time on her hands than she had in 1948, when the King was desperately ill and dying, as, as, as we now realise. And she was taking on a lot of his duties, which meant they were she was taken away by duty from being there with Charles at such a very young age. And likewise with, with Anne, Anne born 1950. The king was getting iller. The queen, as Princess Elizabeth, was doing more. The king died after a year Anne was born. And it meant that the queen was 150% committed to the role of monarch, which took her away for six months to the Commonwealth realms. And yes, that took her away from her children. So when the other family came along, Andrew and Edward, it was a new and breath of life with, with the children, something that Charles and Anne never had. And I think probably in the very early days, Charles might have been um, a little jealous of the, the, the relationship. But, you know, time heals. Um, he didn't have his mother's attention in the same way as Andrew and Edward had their mother's attention. But favourite, no, they were all favourite. She had time for all of them. No one stood out more than the other. I suppose in Andrew's case, yes, he went to the Falklands, he came back. 
with the, with the, with everybody else victorious. He threw his cap in the air. He had a rose between his teeth. He was the darling helicopter pilot, and he did a good job there. He was a decoy helicopter pilot, very dangerous, but he served his time. There's a wonderful story that came out of his time in the navy when uh, when he first joined, and uh, he met his commanding officer. And he said to his CO, uh, you can call me HRH. And the commanding officer said, yeah, and you can call me sir. <laughs> but that just speaks to his arrogance, doesn't it? But yes, I think people, particularly younger generations, it's Andrew has been so enveloped in the whole Epstein scandal. People don't know that he came back from the Falklands by some accounts, a, a war hero. He did use his helicopter as a decoy for an Exocet missile, which was a very brave thing to do. Um, and to give credit where credit's due, he was a very fine member of, of the military. So, um, it's unfortunate that this is how he's going to be remembered. So I'm going to just di divert slightly because in recent months, uh, Andrew has been back in the news, technically through no fault of his own, because to his credit, he has kept his head down. I think you're right. I think uh, humility has perhaps kicked in. But there's been a lot of headlines about how the king is going to throw him out of Royal Lodge. Um, he's taking his home from him, wants to give him Frogmore. And Andrew, as we know, can be a little bit grand. I can see why he he perhaps wouldn't want to leave Royal Lodge for Frogmore Cottage. But as with everything related to the royal family, there is so much more to this. Andrew has a 75 year lease. Uh, the terms of that lease mean that he cannot just be thrown out. Um, there certainly would be some benefits to him moving to Frogmore Cottage because that would reduce the need for security because it's within the Windsor estate. Uh, how much credence do you give these headlines? There's been no official word from Buckingham Palace. It's just one source, the other source. Um, I, I don't think you can just throw him out of Royal Lodge. I don't give them any credence, and, and you can't just throw him out of Royal Lodge. He, as you rightly say, he did sign a 75-year lease. He did pay a one-off million pounds, which basically is his rent for, a, for, for 75 years. Um, and un, unless he doesn't maintain Royal Lodge to the satisfaction and the standard required by the Crown Estate, then he's, he stays put. He doesn't move. And just to add to those figures, Doug, so the, there was the million, but also the, the, those restorations and those upkeep charges. We're talking in a region of seven point five million pounds. So he does have to invest his own money into the property in terms of its upkeep. Yeah, he does have to invest his own money and thereby is the problem. He doesn't have a lot of money. Uh, he's not earning anything. Uh, when the late Queen was alive, she paid £250,000, uh, which was there not as a salary, not as a gift, but as a means of running his office. Now, he has a very small office. Um, he likes to maintain a small office. Whether the King is paying that or whether the King is paying a reduced amount uh, has not been made public. Uh, this money paid by the late Queen was coming out of the Duchy of Lancaster uh, capital, um, which we didn't know anything about. We know that it was paid to the Queen, but we don't know the, the sort of the nuts and bolts of the arrangement. So he does have to maintain. He does have to pay it. You rightly say that if he did move to Frogmore Cottage, it would reduce the, uh, the security costs because he'd be within the Windsor estate. But Andrew is grand. There are some grand rooms in Royal Lodge and he wouldn't want to give those up because uh, Frogmore estate does not have grand rooms. And perhaps in his mind, he's given up everything. Uh, his home is his home. Now, um, let's go back to these television series because I think... If Prince Andrew were able to sweat, he would be sweating bullets right now because these two series are about to come out, which means it's going to raise everything back up again. He must wonder if this is ever going to go away and chances are it's not. Um, so yeah, a bit like buses, we have two television series coming up about Prince Andrew and most notably this particular interview. Now, I think it is interesting to note Michael Sheen is going to be playing Prince Andrew in the Amazon series, uh, A Very Royal Scandal. And he has said in an interview he recently did for one of the Sunday papers, I believe, that um, he doesn't want to do a hatchet job. He wants to find the humanity. And I thought that was really very interesting. He said he doesn't want to be responsible for making everyone like Prince Andrew again. But at the same time, he does want to be cognizant of, of portraying a real person who is very much alive and not wanting to just 
throw them to the wolves. And I think this is going to be really difficult because on one hand, everybody just wants to hate Prince Andrew. That is how they feel. But there is a human being at the center of this. And interestingly, Emily Maitlis, um, ha who conducted the interview, she said when she went to the set of A Very Royal Scandal, which she's executive producing, she was suddenly reminded that this is a real person's life that is being portrayed. And we've seen what happens when dramatization takes over uh, notably in The Crown. So much of The Crown is imagined by Peter Morgan, but people take it as gospel fact. Now, uh, in, in the same fashion, Sam McAllister, who is on board, obviously, because it's her book, Scoop, that is being uh, dramatized by Netflix, she's also said, she used the same turn of phrase, we're not going to do a hatchet job we want the audience to be able to make their own opinions based on what we present. But again, they're presenting a fictionalized account or a dramatized account. This is not a documentary. So I know we don't have a crystal ball. It's impossible to say how Andrew is going to come out of this. I suspect he's hoping for a little public sympathy, but I feel like the public sympathy well has run completely dry. Well, probably in the UK it's run dry. Elsewhere in the world, they might well say, poor Andrew, poor Andrew. It's a very difficult call to make, to make two documentaries, to make two films. I don't know. Uh, well, they're not documentaries, Dad. These are dramatizations. Well, dramatize, uh, docudrama then, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, they're both being uh, advised by Sam McAllister, who wrote the book, who was actually the producer responsible for setting up the interview. E Emily Matis was just the interviewer. Uh, she, she did a very good job. Let's not just it. Yeah, I mean, she she, did, she was amazing. Good, but she wasn't there at the very beginning in terms yeah. of the organizational side of it. Um, and I'm not sure how big a story you can make it beyond the interview um, and how they're going to fluff it up either side. I really don't know. That'll be interesting to see because the first one comes out on Netflix on the 5th of April, which just so happens to be your birthday. Yeah, it's a big birthday this year. Let's not go there just yet. Um, well, I think there's going to be a lot of attention because, of course, Netflix and Amazon can be accessed by people worldwide. And it's certainly possible that more people are going to watch the dramatizations between the two combined channels that even saw the original interview. So I think Prince Andrew is in for a rocky few months because, of course, he's going to probably be on the front page of the newspapers again. He's certainly going to be the topic that everybody is talking about. I know you're meeting up with Sam uh, in the coming days and weeks. Dad. So we are going to revisit this topic once Scoop has been released on Netflix and perhaps we'll do so again once Amazon has released their version as well. Please do keep all of your thoughts, comments and questions coming in the comments section below. Make sure you subscribe, ring the bell and click like and we look forward to seeing you next time on Royal Report.